got a whole bunch of questions for, for our other two speakers up there, and we'll do a few of them in, as long as we have time. Uh, is Dr. Hardy saying that radiation from contaminated ventilation system will continue to be released to the accessible environment periodically? Is that what Dr. Hardy is saying? That, that is Dr. Hardy's assumption. Um, we expect that when more people get in the underground, especially as they start to survey areas, uh, if there is contamination, that we will see spikes at station A, which is the pre-filter um, sampling site, and that uh, as work is done, as air turbulence changes, we will probably see spikes at station B as contamination is currently entrained into the, the ductwork makes its way out of the repository. Okay, and then I had another question about the cesium. Um, it was if you have any speculation about the presence of the cesium, could it be present because of the criticality events in the underground? No, cesium is a fallout product, and so it comes from the detonation of nuclear weapons. Um, I th you know, we've given some thought as to why these 41 folks, only 17% uh, showed a positive detection compared to 28% in the previous sample. Part of it is just the size of the sample. We had 1,300 people we counted in the previous group and only 41 here. But there's some other reasons that we think could cause uh, the, the decrease in the number of, of participants that have a positive intake in cesium. One is we know from, from 17 years of counting people that uh, those folks who eat wild game, who, who uh, wild game is a part of their diet, whether it be deer or elk or rabbit or rattlesnake or whatever, uh, that uh, they have a higher cesium content because the animal eats the, the leafy vegetables that attract or uh, uh, contain the cesium and then when the individual eats the animal they, they get an uptake. We also know that people who use tobacco, whether it's cigarette smoking or chewing or dipping, also have a higher cesium content. So the fact that these 41 had a lower uh, percentage could be that maybe uh, of these 41 they consume less wild game or perhaps uh, tobacco use is not as vogue as it was 17 years ago when we started this process. The other thing I think that uh, needs to be taken into consideration is that cesium over time decays just like all radioactive particles. Uh, cesium has a 30 year half-life and so if you think about uh, when the first cesium was introduced to the environment in the mid-1940s uh, with the first weapons detonations We've had 70 years uh, that have passed since that first cesium was, was released, and so that's roughly two and a third uh, life cycles or uh, half-lives that have passed. And so over time, time is on our side, and the amount of cesium in the environment will continue to decay. Uh, those are all the questions I have for you, Dr. Hardy. Uh, do you want to just move on to some more online questions then? Okay. Well. You guys are up. Um, here's a question we probably could have seen, knew was coming. Another report yesterday claims a lead-lined glove may be responsible. Please explain the physics and chemistry that supports this possibility. Could you repeat? Yeah, I'm sorry, I got a little fast there. Another report yesterday claims a lead-lined glove may be responsible. Can you please explain the physics and chemistry that supports this possibility? I believe there were two reports um, in the Santa Fe New Mexican and the Santa Fe Reporter based on a talk given at the Hazardous Materials Bureau um, meeting with legislators yesterday. And I, I think that question is probably in reference to, to those two media articles. We have independent organizations, the technical assistance team and the accident investigation board evaluating those possibilities. Um, I'm as anxious as everyone else to see the results of their evaluations. And uh, I have not had first-hand knowledge, but I can tell you that um, the chemistry that could potentially cause um, an initiator like that would be um, lead 
or other metals and um, nitric acid can result in some some issues like that but I, I would uh, defer the detailed chemistry to the uh, scientists from across the country in our national labs that are part of the technical assistance team and to the scientists in the Los Alamos National Laboratory that are doing their evaluation in conjunction with the Accident Investigation Board. Uh, me to do I heard, uh, read those same reports, and they said that it was a glove box when they were repackaging that particular barrel, they broke it up into two parts. And this glove or whatever went into that barrel that they used. So they're thinking that that possibly could have had something to do with it. Um, and a representative from Energy Solutions said, we don't believe the contamination, the combination that we put into the drums has the ability to start burning on its own. It needs an outside source of ignition. Now what that would be, I don't know, but we did have a fire in the underground and they suggested that that fire caused heat so is there a possibility that that fire caused heat in other parts of the mine that could have caused this, in your opinion? That, that fire was hundreds of yards away um, and we had a considerable ventilation flow going through the underground. Um, any, any effect would have been negligible in my opinion. I again am, am relying on the experts that are doing the evaluations up at Los Alamos right now and um, you, you just quoted one person that said something uh, earlier today we saw another quote in the newspaper from a scientist at Los Alamos that addressed uh, legislators uh, from New Mexico um, My primary concern right now is the safety of the people going into the underground and um, we believe that we are, are maintaining that safety and as far as the ultimate cause, uh, I'm waiting for the Accident Investigation Board and their independent analysis, uh, which um, we're, we're all uh, anxious for. And ju just to add to that, there, you know, right in the beginning, there was a huge amount of speculation about what might have happened, and it turned out to be something completely different than what everybody had even speculated could have happened. And I think that to speculate in advance what what really happened until the scientists really figure it out, I think is is. Uh, not something that any of us ought to try to do. I think that we ought to wait for the conclusions and uh, maybe something totally different from what we think it was going to be. But everybody uh, is always uh, trying to do super sleuthing type things and try to figure out what might have happened. So it's in our nature, but uh, it may be something totally different. Okay, I think I'm going to probably have time to just do maybe a couple more. And um, I, have, I had a couple questions uh, about uh, worker safety and so forth. Uh, one of the questions is, what is the health status of the staff that was initially affected by this incident? And then um, a somewhat related question, what is the maximum dose that any worker going underground has received since April 2nd? And so if you could uh, group those together or not group those together.
As far as workers going underground to support the entries, there has been no dose that I'm aware of that anyone has received and no contamination events. But the, the people going to the waste phase, there's a very low radiation dose um, emanating from the containers, but it would have been in the order of millirems uh, over hours of standing there. As far as the people that were affected by the uptake um, the day of the event, um, we, we showed that uh, they had less than 10 millirem each. Uh, this was less than actually the recordable uh, requirements for the Department of Energy. And uh, I think, I believe people uh, range from like uh, two to seven millirem for their exposure. And that, that is no health effects. Uh, this is a very specific question, and so I don't know it's, what is the temperature at the front of panel six? I know panel seven. <laughs> Do, can you tell us the temperature at the front of panel seven? So every time we've gone into panel seven, they do take um, a thermography, what we call a thermography gun, and they measure the temperature. And so in panel seven, it's been around 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to surmise, because we haven't measured that I'm aware of the actual temperature at panel six, because first of all, we haven't gone into panel six, because it already had its initial closure um, material in place. But based on the location, I would suspect it would be somewhere in that same range of temperature. Okay. And uh, let's do just one more today, and then we will send you guys any ones that we didn't get to. And I again apologize to our online folks for some of the lag today. Uh, Tammy, I think you addressed this a little bit earlier, but uh, you were talking about the boom over a month ago. Why has this taken so long? If you could maybe just explain the, some of the timetable issues. Um, they, they're, they're asking why it's, yeah. if you could explain the, the timetable a little bit. They, they said the, you were talking about the boom over a month ago. Why has this taken so long? Oh, the boom. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you said boom. Um, the boom that, is this the boom that we're trying to procure now? The boom? Yes. The 90 foot boom? Okay. So um, I somewhat talked about the challenge with trying to reach out 90 feet. Um, what you find when you have to reach out that far and then also put a camera on the end of a device that far out, that you have to try to control vibration and movement because you want to be able to get pictures and that's the whole purpose, the intent of the um, reaching that far. And so um, we had to go out and look at vendors. We went out and solicited for vendors that could provide a technology that would meet that criteria. And so there's a process you go through and vendors, you know, we had a couple of vendors that came back to us with their um, approaches to be able to achieve those technical um, criteria. And we made a selection, we've met with them, we made a selection, we had to, you know, ensure that they can meet the criteria, the needs we have for that. And that selection's been made now, we have met with them and we're starting that process for them to fabricate this boom. And if you don't mind, I'm going to sneak in one more because I think it's related to some other questions. It's, the question is, did changes in ventilation following the fire cause temperature to increase in the underground? And I'm going to pass the mic away so I don't ask any more. Changes, uh, well, what we see is um, typically changes in the outdoor temperature will have an effect in the underground as well. So there's a combination, so I'll expand on that question a little bit. Changes in ventilation, and it's not just unique to the mine, but it would be unique to any ventilation system. So flow rates, um, the outside temperature, when you're pulling in outside temperature to cool or heat an area um, can have an effect on um, temperature. So yes, I would expect there to be somewhat of a, a change in temperature. It wouldn't be very much, but um, outside ambient temperature will have an effect on the temperature in the underground. 